All right, hey, morning everybody. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so, the announcement's up there. No homework tonight, um, but there is gonna be some homework over the weekend. It's gonna be due Monday. That's gonna be things related to the next unit. Uh, so hopefully today we'll get through everything that will be on the exam for next Tuesday. Uh, if not, a little bit will hang over to Monday and I'll make sure that's clear. Um, so tonight, I strongly recommend that you start studying for the exam, which is going to be on Tuesday, um, and also start working on your report outline. Uh, up on Blackboard, you will find topics list, uh, practice, a full practice test. Um, some of the questions on the practice test might be from some of the things you've already seen before, but just so you see it in a full together format. Um, and there, if it's not already up, then it soon will be the, the key for the practice test. Uh, and, um, and Megan's working right now on some extra resources that she's gonna put together. Um, also, it's not listed up there, but um, I suppose I should put it up there. Three o'clock, um, on Saturday, um, there's going to be a review session here in this room. Um, both Megan and Amanda will be here for that, and they uh, have, um, and they will have some material that they've already put together and prepared uh, from the topics guides and and uh, and notes that they've got and the class notes and everything. Um, and a few points for you to look at. And, uh, and discuss together. And then also there will be time for uh, you to ask your questions at that, at that review session. Um, so that'll be here in this room at three o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Um, for today, we're gonna talk, uh, re return to and spend a little bit more time talking about this idea of critical periods. Um, I gathered that that was something that a lot of people felt a little bit unsure about what was meant, what we mean by a critical period. Um, and sort of comparing it with the idea of a sensitive period. Um, critical period is in, a, is, is in a lot of ways an outdated term now, um, but you still hear it a lot, and people just sort of, when they say critical period, they really mean sensory period these, these days. Um, because, well, yeah, as we'll see, this, this, the differences between the definitions of those things, we sort of recognize that there's not really such a thing as a truly critical period, um, as so much as like enhanced sensitivity to learning at different stages in development. But I do wanna describe those, spend a little bit more time talking about them, and make sure everybody feels comfortable with that topic, because that's pretty important for your ability to understand the Fixing My Gaze book and what goes on with that, um, as well as uh, the material that we're gonna be talking about today in terms of auditory map just, uh, development, which happens in um, barn owls, which is gonna be the, the primary uh, model organism that we're going to be talking about. Um, of course, auditory localization, uh, as, um, as Megan pointed out in her uh, slides yesterday, um, happens in humans as well. Um, and in humans, it depends actually a lot on the shape of the outer ear. And we'll return to that idea a little bit uh, today, but, um, but mostly focus in then on, uh, on barn owls because they've been very well studied and they're actually a great system for studying uh, sound localization. Um, so we'll give a general overview of owls and then there's two studies that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, the first study has kind of two pieces to it. Um, and in that first study, um, the first part that we're gonna talk about is reorganization of the auditory system in young owls um, and reorganization of the, the, the map of the external world that owls develop and, and, um, and use in order to figure out where a sound is coming from. Um, and then in that same paper, there's a second point being made about adult owls and how they are different from these young owls. Um, and so we'll talk about that as well as sort of the next point in that paper. Um, and then, the, and then um, there's a, a different study that we're going to look at after that. And that different study um, has, a, um, has, something, has some additional things to add to the story about adult owls. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about all of that uh, as we get going. So um, with the idea of critical periods, this is the one slide that I had about it, and um, I think it wasn't as fully 
uh, or I didn't spend as much time as I, as I pro probably should have talking about critical periods. So um, this, the, the organism in which this was first defined and first sort of systematically studied is, is cats. And so we'll just kind of take the cat as an example. Um, so little baby cats, pretty soon after they're born, they open their eyes. Um, a lot of animals actually um, keep their eyes closed for days after birth. Um, humans are born and their eyes are open actually uh, well before they're born. Um, they've already got their eyes open. Um, but some animals are born and their eyes stay closed for, for a little period of time. Cats' eyes open pretty soon after birth. Uh, and, they, and their brains are already visually responsive. So if you take um, a cat that is, uh, say, one week old, its eye is open, its brain is visually responsive, and you cover, that, uh, cover one eye for, uh, for a period of, say, four days, and then you uncover it, and you let it go the rest of its life with normal visual experience. So we've got sort of experiment number one um, is we take a cat, here's birth, and then one week, let's say just one, from one to two weeks of age, we've got its left eye covered. And then after that, we uncover it and let it go. And we can check it when it's like three months old or when it's like two years old. And, um, and so here, here now what we're doing is we're, is we're um, recording visual activity. And if you do this to a cat, then even though it's had a week-long period early in life when one eye was covered and one eye was uncovered, that cat will have normal visual um, capacity in both eyes. Its visual cortex will have this zebra stripe pattern to it where there are um, approximately equal um, amounts of visual cortex that are receiving input from the left eye and the right eye, no matter which one you've covered during that period. And so what we say is that before that time, bef is that this sort of early sensory manipulation doesn't alter the animal's adult experience, adult, um, adult uh, visual system. So whatever we did during that one week didn't have a lasting impact. Um, if we say, OK, now experiment number two. Um, so let's record normal and normal. All right, experiment number two, take another cat. Cat gets born. Uh, and then we wait until the cat is three weeks old. And then we cover its eye, cover left eye. Um, for a week until it's four weeks old. Uncover it, let time go on. This is not a linear plot, but here we are, three months old, so a couple a couple uh, two months after we've uncovered the eye, and we record and there is no response in the left eye, uh, to the left eye. The brain is unresponsive of the left eye. Even though we only had it covered for a week, and there were three weeks before where it was the left eye was getting plenty of, of, of input, three weeks, uh, eight weeks after where the left eye was getting plenty of input. Um, and yet, because we covered it for the one week during this particular time window in the development of the animal, its, um, its left eye is now unresponsive, and we would find that the right eye, which is the one that we've, we've um, allowed to stay open during the, this critical time window, um, takes over the entire visual cortex um, in, terms of its, um, in terms of the cells that are responding to it, in terms of where the inputs from the thalamus are going into layer four of the visual cortex. Um, and, so, and so that one week of sensory manipulation during this time window in development 
causes the animal to have a dramatic reorganization of, its, um, of the functional responses of its neurons as well as the physical zones in its cortex that are getting input from the two eyes. And we could follow this out, also wait until this cat's two years old, and again, so we record, and then there's going to be no response in our left eye. The eye itself, actually, if you record from the retinal cells, they're still working. Um, but, and the thalamic cells, are kind, the, the LGN cells are kind of still working, but the visual cortex and everything else beyond it, no, no awareness, no response to what's going on. Okay, and then, so, and then the, we can do, you know, the, we can do, pick hundreds of different time windows, but just one other experiment that's sort of instructive. Again, another cat, it's born. And then um, over here, we leave it alone until it gets to be three months old. And then at three months of age, we take its left eye and we cover it for a pretty long period. So left eye covered for, let's say, two months. And then if we wait a little while after this, until the animal is six months old, so another month afterwards, um, or until the animal is one year old, or until the animal is two years old, at any of these time windows, we can record and the responses are entirely normal, exactly the same as a cat that we never closed either eye for. Uh, and so even though the sensory manipulation that we did here was more dramatic than what we did in this case, in the second case, um, it was two months instead of for a period of one week. Even though it was a more dramatic sensory manipulation, um, it was uh, the 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 brain was um, sort of done. Well, well, we'll revise this a little bit in a minute. But but for sort of for right now, we'll say the brain was done organizing its visual system. And so by the time the animal got three months old, um, the brain was finished with this whole let's figure out how to organize our visual system business. And so. The, um, and so we do some massive um, alteration where we cover the eye not for a week, but for two months, four times as long, eight times as long, and still we see no, um, we see no uh, reorganization of the visual system. And you can do a bunch of other experiments, and what you end up finding is that for animals that are less than two weeks old, you can mess around with their sensory systems and with the visual system. Different senses have slightly different windows of time. But for an animal that's less than, a cat that's less than two weeks old, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff to its, its, uh, its um, visual system. And as long as you let it, as long as it, it, you undo that before the animal gets into the critical time window, then, um, then the animal will develop normally. Um, for an animal that's more than three months old, same thing. You can do all kinds of crazy, crazy sensory manipulations. It's not going to have an effect. Um, but during this time window between uh, three weeks and three months of age, which is what this chart is supposed to kind of illustrate, um, the, um, the visual system is highly sensitive to any kind of change that you do in, the sens in any kind of sensory manipulation. And if you alter sensory experience during that time window, then it seems like the changes that happen there persist for the rest of the animal's life. And so we therefore say that the critical period, the critical time in development where the visual system is figuring out what to do and where it really matters what kind of sensory input it's getting is for a cat, three weeks to three months old. Um, in different organisms, they develop different, in different rates, and so the critical time window is different for different organisms. Okay, so what questions do people have about that, about the idea of this critical period?
Okay, so this I, so the idea of critical periods have have been around since really the 1960s when um, when Hubel and Wiesel first um, did these experiments looking at um, the the cat visual system. Actually, I think I have a slide back here somewhere just sort of to put faces to the names showing. Um, there's uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, um, and they, uh, they are the two neurophysiologists. They won the Nobel Prize for the work that, that they did, who um, really established this idea that you, that, that you can experimentally alter the sensory systems of an animal by altering the experiences that it has. They did do some other experiments. So, so actually, I guess, well, yeah. Two, two, two other points to make about that. Um, first, it turns out that it's not quite as simple as this. As with anything in neuroscience, the more you study it, you find out that it's more complicated. Um, and in fact, there are things that you can do, ways that you can alter sensory experience beyond just closing and opening an eye that can cause reorganization in the adult visual system. Um, if you alter the pattern of sensory input instead of just open and closing, that can actually rewire adult, the adult visual cortex. Um, in addition to that, um, there you can have um, if if uh, if you alter a little bit the pharmacological um, environment. So certain types of medications will actually make the brain plastic again. So you can take an adult brain, for example, and apply a lot of dopamine to it. And now these sensory manipulations will cause a reorganization. Um, and that kind of relates to one of the ideas from the Fixing My Gaze book, um, the idea that uh, if, um, if uh, Dr. Barry stays motivated at what she's doing and focused at what she's doing, then she can actually prompt a reorganization of her visual system in the adult brain. That's the first point. The second point, which is incredibly important to keep straight, is that this experiment and all of the stuff in monocular deprivation is, while they're both visual system things, is totally different from the strabismus thing. That nobody, like, a lot of students got confused about this the last, last semester when I taught this. Nobody sewed shut one of Dr. Barry's eyes. Um, there are actually some times where people will have patches put um, on, 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 on a child's eyes for some period of the time um, if, if the child is not, it doesn't have binocular vision because you want to, um, if one eye is becoming too dominant, you actually cover that up to kind of help the other eye win out. Um, but in Dr. Berry's case, nobody sewed shut an eye, nobody put an eye patch on her, nobody did that. Um, her eyes, uh, naturally, because her musculature was, was a little bit off, um, didn't align properly and point to the same thing. Um, and so, and so nobody, nobody sewed shut her eyes. Um, she didn't have monocular deprivation. This idea of, of depriving one eye of visual input, monocular deprivation, is something that we do to animals primarily, and it's an experimental way to have a really big alteration in the sensory experiences that an animal's getting, uh, and that big alteration in the animal's sensory experiences will then um, give us a big change that we can detect easily. And so that makes it very ex experimentally um, um, uh, testable and studyable. What happened with Dr. Barry is the misalignment of the eyes. You can do that to an animal. Um, and if you do do that to an animal by doing sort of the opposite of the surgery that she had, then what you will find is that um, the animal will have some cells that respond to one eye, some cells that respond to the other, but, bare, but very few, if any, cells that are combining those images into a coherent whole. But one thing that has never been done, wasn't done by, uh, wasn't done by Hubel and Wiesel, wasn't done by the time Dr. Barry's uh, story came around, still hasn't been done, is to do this to an animal and then realign its eyes, and then convince the animal to spend weeks practicing looking at a little ball on a string and see if you can reorganize its visual cortex and make it look more like the normal case here. Um, and the, the real challenge there is not the realignment of the eyes. The real challenge there is getting the animal to get motivated again to, um, to do the hard work necessary to learn, to learn stereo vision as an adult. 
Um, and so we, based on this, have some sense of, like, for monocular deprivation, if you don't have other, um, other uh, things that you've changed in terms of, like, giving the animal dopamine or whatever, um, then we have a sense that there is this critical time window between three weeks and three months um, where, where experience matters. Um, people thought that it was going to be the same for, for strabismus, and there's st there is actually a fair amount of evidence that it probably is in a lot of cases, but um, there are at least some cases um, that people have, um, have found that they can get plasticity and reorganization in an adult. Um, and so, okay, so yeah, so what questions do people have about the, the, the idea of monocular deprivation, the closing of one eye, versus strabismus, the um, misalignment of the two eyes? Um, okay, and so, um, so, uh, and, then, and then because, so, so because since Hubel and Weasel, we have learned that if you take um, a, a sort of teenagerish cat, not the young, young cats here, but sort of the juvenile cats, and you, um, or even an adult cat, and you alter um, the complement of neurotransmitters and, and modulators like dopamine that are around, then you can sort of, they, they used to say that we reopen the critical period, meaning that you can now get a, get a, get a reorganization if you do some other things along with it. Um, the idea of critical periods has, in the last 20 or 30 years, fallen out of favor um, and people now think much more about sensitive, people prefer, um, when they're being thoughtful about what the words they use, prefer to say sensitive period rather than critical period. Um, and the idea of a sensitive period is kind of the same thing as a critical period, that between three weeks and three months of age, the animal's brain is highly sensitive to sensory manipulations. Um, and if you change the environment that the animal's in or the way it's experiencing the world, then you get a dramatic reorganization. Um, but it's not, it's not critical in the sense that it's not like the only time the animal's brain is paying any attention to the world. Um, there is, uh, there is um, beyond, out, outside of this sensitive time window, you can still cause changes. It's just that the brain is not as sensitive to those changes, and so you need to work harder or change the mix of neurotransmitters or motivate the animal or whatever to cause plasticity outside of this time where it's highly sensitive to these sensory manipulations. Um, and, so, and so most neurophysiologists, um, when they're being thoughtful about what they say, will prefer to say sensitive period rather than critical period. Um, sometimes you still see critical period written, even by neurophysiologists that know that it's wrong, and they just, they're when they're communicating with each other, um, they will say critical period without bothering to specify that oh, by the way, it's really a sensitive period. Um, and so if people get sloppy with their language, they'll say, criti they'll say critical period. Um, and if you're communicating with other experts, then the other experts will like, know that you understand that it's really a sensitive period and not a critical period. Um, and, that's, um, and so you know, communication works fine, but it can be confusing coming to this um, uh, for the first time. And... and um, you know, see, seeing critical period thrown around um, when really there's a lot of evidence that um, that it's really that that the proper term would be to call it a sensory a sensitive period. Okay, so yeah, so what questions do people have about any of that? Uh, like I said, it seems like this was something that people were a little bit unsure about with respect to the fixing my gaze reading and also um, the, the the lecture about visual system in general. Okay, everybody's a little quiet today. We'll, we'll fix that by the end of class. Um, okay, so, whoops. So, there we go. Done with point number one. Um, okay, so, so now, uh, barn owls and sound localization in general. Um, so, so, Megan uh, talked about this already, and, um, and, the, uh, and just to kind of review what, um, what the story is with humans, um, humans are really good at 
figuring out where a sound is. Like here, 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 in the, in the x-axis, or what we call the azimuth, but that's the technical term. I, x-axis is fine. Um, and then in terms of the y-axis, elevation, humans can do it, but we're not great. Uh, and so the reason that humans are really good at the x-axis is that we actually have two different cues that we can rely on. They both rely on the fact that we have two ears, but there are two different um, uh, sort of redundant signals. So if something's over here, um, and, and it's closer to my right ear than my left, what's going to be different about um, how, it, how it arrives and how it's perceived or detected by my right ear as, com as compared to my left. So it's over here on the right side of my body. What's different about the way my right hear ear is hearing that sound versus how my left ear is hearing that sound? Sure, yeah. The time in which uh, the sound reaches the cochlea? Yeah, yeah, the time. So, and yeah, so yeah, let's. That over here. Yeah, so like Megan mentioned yesterday, the, um, so sound on the right arrives at right ear first, faster, sooner, sooner um, than left. And we call this the intra aural timing difference or ITD. So my two ears, it arrives here sooner than here. Um, anyone know how fast sound travels? 3 e 8 meters per second. Th th uh, was that? 3 e, or 3 times 10 to the eight. Yeah, 3 times, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, I, I sort of remember it in miles per hour, which ends up being about 300 miles per hour. But yeah, it's something like that. So 3, yeah, so, so um, uh, but yeah. So sound travels pretty darn fast. Um, it's not, you know, light is essentially instantaneous um, for everything that we have to deal with unless you're doing astronomy. Um, but sound is, um, uh, but sound is um, is pretty darn fast, but not um, but not instantaneous. Um, so so and so going that fast, the t so a click over here, like right over here, totally to the right, it has half a meter, maybe less, a quarter of a meter, something like that, tenth of a meter. I don't know. I'm bad at metric, bad at measuring in general, but. There's, there's not like, you know, it's not like a mile distance between this ear and this ear. Um, uh, and it's not, um, it's not 300 miles distance, which is what you would need for it to be a second between my ears. So it doesn't arrive at this ear a second before this ear. Um, it's, not even, um, uh, it's not even 30 feet, which is what it would uh, need, need for it to arrive at this ear one millisecond before this ear. Um, or 60 feet or something like that. Um, and so, you know, my head's not 60 feet wide, which is what it would take tra sound to travel in a, in a millisecond. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's kind of crazy, right? Neurons are pretty fast compared to the way, like, you know, I, I, I operate on a scale of seconds to minutes. Um, I, I sort of perceive changes that, you know, something happening and then a half second later I can tell that the other thing happened a half second later. Um, if two things happen within a millisecond of each other, I can't perceive that difference if you're showing me something. Um, uh, and, so, um, and so it's my neurons, the, the action potential width is one or two milliseconds. A neuron is sort of a millisecond, it has sort of a resolution of a millisecond in its processing. Um, and yet the difference in timing between my two ears when it's here versus here, where they're simultaneous here, it's going to arrive at this ear maybe 60 microseconds sooner than the other, um, which is 0 0.06 milliseconds. Um, and I can tell the difference not just between here and here, but I can tell the difference between here and here. 
and the diff and the and here it's arriving 60 microseconds sooner at my year than here. Here it's arriving 50 microseconds sooner at this year than this. So I can tell the difference between those two times in terms of things arriving at my year, which is crazy fast. Um, and actually, it's an entire lecture in itself and a, and a mostly unsolved problem, in fact, um, as to how the nervous system manages to distinguish between things that happen 20 times faster or 100 times faster than the duration of an action potential. How it can tell the difference between things that have that narrow, that, that sort of precise of a time window. But yet, yeah, so, so, but nonetheless, we can do it, and that's awesome, and we're really good at sound localization on the x-axis because of it. Um, there's one other difference. So, um, and you can, everyone like kind of go like this and just click your finger, snap your finger, or clap your hands or something over there. So, so what else do you perceive differently? Not only the timing, but there's something else that you might perceive differently about the way, the way it sounds in this ear versus the way it sounds in this ear. Um, yeah, it's clear, or you know, to make it even more, obvious you can do this so yeah so it's also um, louder in right here when something's on the right side right here um, and so we call this the intraoral level difference ILD just like the intraoral timing difference um, and that is a second cue that our brains can rely on to figure out where things are. And those are somewhat redundant with each other. And so between the two of them, we've got two sources of information that typically agree with each other and give us a good indication of where things are left to right. Um, and if you want to do, um, if you want to have a, a, a game to play at your next neuroscience party, um, you can have people close their eyes and, click and start snapping fingers and tell them to point. And then you can also play around with the up-down for these finger snaps. Um, and what you will find is that people are really good at the x-axis, but kind of crappy at the y-axis, at up-down. Um, people can do it, but it's not very good. And but if instead of finger clicks, you, um, you have them sit still and then you have some music and you move the speaker up and down, then people will actually do pretty well at figuring out where things are up and down. Um, and that relates to, so what, what humans use for up and down relies on what Megan was talking about last time, which is the external ear. And if you put, if you cup your hands around your, uh, around your outer ear or put clay ears on somebody or something like that, then, um, then they will no longer be very good at figuring out up-down. You can still figure out left-right if you have your hands cupped over your ears, but the up-down goes away because um, different frequencies get filtered differently by the top of my ear versus the bottom of my ear. And so for a complex sound that has many different frequencies in it, I am able to figure out where it is by the way those frequencies change as the sound moves up and down. Um, and that's a pretty complex and indirect way of doing it. But for humans, we use this sort of differential frequency filtering by our pinna, the outer ear. Um, in up versus down. Um, but you know, as, as Megan talked about last time, if somebody, uh, if, if somebody has nearly a month where they've got these clay ears on, then they get better and better. They adapt and reorganize so that they can again do up-down localization. Um, on the first day of the clay ears, they can still already do XY localization, but they've lost the ability to do, uh, sorry, X, X axis, left-right localization, but they've lost the ability to do up-down localization on day one. They, they mostly regain it by the last day. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Okay, so um, owls are amazing at sound localization. They're way better than us. 
Um, and I, I'm not going to show the whole video, but it's up on Blackboard. Um, but I do want to show just like the first 30 seconds or so of this video. They're going to try and capture um, in high speed an owl swooping down. And what you'll see, they're going to show it first in real time, and the owl goes up and then swoops down pretty quickly. The whole thing takes about two seconds. Um, and then the high speed camera, you'll see the owl going up and swooping down the whole time that the owl is doing this. They've got a little squeaker that's down there um, that they've trained the owl to swoop and stomp on. Um, and the whole time that the owl is doing that, its head is like pointed straight down right at this thing. Uh, and so here is. Um, I would like to see this. an incredibly detailed, beautiful slow motion shot of a barn owl getting its prey. So, Lloyd, I can hear our star of the day behind us there. That's the barn owl, isn't it? And you've got something in your hand here that's going to hopefully lure her in. Now, what makes her very special is every time we fed her, we did that sound. And it brought out a natural instinct to use her hearing to locate the beeper. Because she's really... She always really turns toward, toward the beeper. So we have to be really quiet because her whole world is sound. So she hears the slightest little whisper of someone talking and it will distract her. So that's the real time, just a couple seconds to fly up and swoop down. She's just got her head oriented straight toward this um, and is relying on her ears, which are sort of embedded in her head. Okay, so one other thing that I want to point out um, from this video about the owl is, so owls have this sort of characteristic shape where they've got these darker feathers behind their head and then surrounding their eyes there are these light, um, these, these whiter feathers. Um, those white feathers surrounding the face uh, are very sound permeable. They don't, they don't um, uh, uh, filter the sound hardly at all. Uh, and so the, and, and so we have our external ear, our pinna, that, um, that filters sound. Um, the owl's whole head is like one big ear with two holes on either side of the skull. And so its whole head actually accomplishes the sort of filtering process that, um, that our um, brain, that our, that our, that our uh, individual external ears accomplish. Okay, and so owls are... Um, so I guess actually before we go on to talk in more detail about owls um, and, and talk about how owls are different from humans, do people have any questions about the human case or about like what we just saw with the owl? Any, any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, okay, so, so owls, just like humans, rely on this interaural timing difference to detect left versus right. Um, and interaural level difference is a little bit of a clue for them too, but it's almost wasteful in our sensory systems, in our auditory systems, to have two cues, the timing and the sound, that both give us the same information left versus right. And since um, our ears are really, really good, and it's pretty straightforward um, to figure out timing because we're, so, um, because we're so highly tuned for it, because every, every animal's brain is so highly tuned for timing, timing by itself is pretty much sufficient to figure out left versus right. The, the sound, the level, the loudness in one ear versus the other, just kind of confirms what we already knew based on the timing. 
And so it's, you know, it's a little helpful. It might kind of give us a little bit more precision because we have a secondary queue. But it's almost wasting a, a potential source of information um, to tell us something that we basically already knew from the timing. Um, and yet we do use those two, those two pieces of information kind of redundantly with each other and in a little bit of an inefficient way. And then we have to build a whole other complex set of processing that predicts and models different frequencies of sound and compares their levels at different points in time and makes prediction about what the real sound source is versus what the frequencies we're hearing are and how those things might have been filtered by our external ear. And there's a whole lot of extra effort that we go through to figure out the up-down. And we can do it, but it's a lot of effort to do. Um, and so owls are just like, to heck with this. That's a, that's a pain in the butt. Not going to worry about this whole thing, um, about this external ear. And instead, the owl, let's see if I can come back over here. Yeah, exit full screen. Um, instead, the owl um, has a funky arrangement to its skull where its right ear points up and its left ear points down inside the skull. You don't see that on the outside because it's all covered with feathers, but the right ear points up and the left ear points down. And so if something is up high, it's going to be louder. In, they're, they're the same distance. So something right here. It's the same distance to my two ears, but the right ear is designed to pick it up when, better when it's up here, and the left ear is designed to pick it up better when it's down here. Um, and so the timing, the timing is all about, about left-right, um, just like in humans, but instead, because of the owl's ears being pointed in this differential way, it can now, things that are above it will be louder in the right ear, and things that are below it will be louder in the left. And so owls, so this is, so owls and mammals use sound timing for x, y, for left, right. Um, but then owls in particular, um, the sounds above are louder in the right ear. And sounds below are going to be louder in the left ear. And so the owl now has a way to use this second piece of information about sound intensity, not to give it something it already knew, which is left, right, but give it something new that it didn't know, which is whether it's where it is up versus down. And, um, and so here, this is a figure uh, that, um, that I just grabbed off of Google Images, but it's a really nice illustration of this. Um, so here on the left, so this is, again, interaural level difference. So here on the left, down here, this is showing the comparative timings. Um, so I guess actually, so I, it's, it's, it's as much as 130 microseconds, but still, you know, not a lot of time. Um, but the owl can distinguish something that's here versus something that's here, which is a 10 microsecond difference in terms of left, right. Um, and so in terms of timing, whether if it's something straight ahead of you, then it's going to arrive at the two ears simultaneously. If something is on your left, it arrives at the left ear first. If something's on the right, it arrives at the right ear first. Um, but then um, when something's, ba essentially, there's a little bit of a sort of swirliness to this because the ears actually are also physically in different spots. But essentially, when something is um, at an elevation that is directly in front of you, then it's equally loud in both ears. When it is at a higher elevation, then it's going to be louder in the right ear. And when it's at a lower elevation, it's going to be louder in the left ear. And so between these two maps, between the timing and the, um, and the um, level, the owl is able to um, figure out where in its auditory world a sound is coming from and very precisely locate in individual sound. And unlike humans who are, who are terrible at individual like click, 
click, click, that's really hard to do. If you do it a bunch of times, then you start to pick out the frequencies. But a single individual click, it's really hard to know whether somebody clicked a little bit and in, in, had, their, had their thumb a little bit tighter so it was higher pitch or whether it was um, up higher so it was higher pitch. Um, but for an owl, an individual click, even if it doesn't know the frequency components in reality out there of that click, it can immediately tell where it is using these two signals that are now not redundant with each other but are giving it different pieces of information. Okay, so yeah, what's up? Yeah, so this is looking at it actually from the owl's perspective. So if you're the owl looking at it, then, the, then my right ear is here. And so up high is going to be better in my right ear and down low is better in my left. Okay. Yeah. But how does it differentiate when the sound is coming from above the owl and when it's coming from the right of the owl? Because above is louder in the right ear and, um, and to the right is sooner in the right ear. So the, so the, microsec the 10 microsecond delay between when it gets here and when it gets here, that tells it this direction. And then the five decibels louder here versus here, that tells it this. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. so, so, so timing is all about left, right. And uh, does that, does that can yeah. it help make sense? And then loudness is about up down. My question, I guess my next question would be, is there a difference between the loudness if the sound's coming in from my right, from like my x-axis? Is there a, like a tiny difference in the loudness from the, uh, that my right ear receives? And for an owl? For us. Even. For us, yes. Oh, absolutely. And, and, that's, and, and, and so for, for, for mammals, and actually even a lot, most birds, um, they use, um, they use timing and loudness as redundant cues about x-axis and then need to rely on other things about frequency filtering to figure out up-down, um, which is a whole, which is adding, like, which is making a much more complicated arrangement. But yes, yeah, so, so for, for, for mammals, over here is louder and sooner. And so I get a lot of useful, I get two redundant, usually agreeing information, pieces of information about where things are in this axis. And so I get really good at figuring that out. Does that help? So, so it's like, so the bird, the, the, the owl, not all birds, but the owl isn't doing the same computations with, sa with sound volume that we are. Sound volume for us is just telling us about left, right. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with timing for us. Um, for the owl, timing is the only thing it uses for left, right, and volume it uses for up, down. Does that kind of yeah, help? I guess I was just confused or just thinking if there, would, there could be a case where the owl would be a little bit confused because just the numbers added up that it could have been coming in from the red at a certain speed and loudness. I mean, you can mess with this and give it things that don't fall necessarily any, anywhere on this map um, if, you, if you're sort of tricking the owl a little bit, so you can. But for, for, sound, for real sounds that exist out in the real world, um, this, the, because of the owl's anatomy and physiology, this is the map that exists. Um, and for sounds in the real world, they all essentially follow this map. Um, if you have headphones that you put in the owl and place, you can give it artificial sounds that can't be that can't be coming from one spot in the real world. And then the owl will either interpret that as maybe two different sounds or will get confused. So I mean, yeah, you can confuse it. And there are things there are there are possible differences in timing and loudness for a sound that would confuse an owl because it doesn't fall anywhere on the map. Yeah, so that is possible. Yeah. Um, Okay, other questions about that? Okay, so, so after spending kind of a little bit of time talking about the up-down in owls, um, we're going to just put that aside for a little while. Um, so here, we're done with this idea of sound localization intro. We're going to put that aside for a little while, and for the rest of these points, we're just going to look at the interaural timing difference, which is our left versus right localization sequence uh, cue. And so um, 
what we're going to be doing for the last half hour of class is talking about two papers and sort of three different points from those two papers. And in those two papers, there's essentially one um, um, basic uh, idea or basic experiment that they're doing. So um, the, the actual recordings that they do, the measurements that they do, is they put um, earbuds, little owl earbuds, into the owl's ears and play a sound that either is simultaneous in both earbuds or is a few microseconds sooner in one ear or a few microseconds sooner in the other ear. Um, and then with those earbuds in, playing those sounds, they watch and see where the owl turns. And so if, the, if you play it sooner in the right ear than the left, then the owl will look over to the right. If you play it sooner in the left ear than the right, the owl will look over to the left. If you play it simultaneously, then the owl will just kind of perk up and look straight ahead. <clears throat> and the data that you're going to see in this will have something like this where it's interaural timing difference in microseconds. And so here's zero microseconds. And so the owl looks. And so this is essentially like um, where the owl looks, where up is more forward, and, over, and, and lower on this is more to the side. And so at zero microseconds, the owl looks right up. If the timing arrives sooner in the left ear, then we say, then we call it maybe minus 20 microseconds, and the owl looks a little bit more to the left. If it arrives way sooner, then it's maybe minus 40 microseconds, and the owl looks more to the left like that. And then similarly over here for positive, plus 20 means it arrives in the right ear first, plus 40 means it arrives in the right ear even more sooner. And so you get this sort of curve that looks like this that is showing you the owl's, how the owl turns its head when it's got different sounds. If an owl got confused and thought that sounds straight in front of it arrived in the left ear first, then it would look straight forward for this, and then the curve would sort of fall off like that instead. Um, so if the owl somehow got itself all mixed up and turned around, and its brain decided that, that straight ahead wasn't simultaneous, straight ahead is in the left ear first by 20 microseconds, then the curve shifts like that. So that's the experimental measurement that we're making. Um, the experimental manipulation, the thing that we're messing with the owl, uh, messing with the owl about, is, we're ta is we take owls and give them glasses that have prisms on them. And those prisms are tilted and they shift the visual world by some number of degrees, like 15 or 20 degrees or 5 or 10 degrees, depending on how powerful the prism is. And we're going to let the owl fly around for a month or longer, maybe even a year, with these prisms on its face. So it's spending 24-7, got these prisms strapped to its eyes, and we're going to see whether strapping these prisms to its eyes such that, so if I strap the prisms to my eyes and they, and they sort of twist that way, then when I look forward, I'm going to see over there. And so when something arrives in my right ear first, I need to orient my head forward so that my vision goes to that spot to the right. Does that make sense to everybody? So I want to see over there. Used to be to see over there, I point my head that way. But now to see over there, because the prisms have, have twisted my visual world, to see over there, I look this way. And then because of optics, I see that spot. And so that means now for me, the, right, the, the correct thing to do is to point my head here when something arrives at my right ear before my left. Does that make sense? Okay, you get, to, you get a chance to play with it and discuss it. And so um, the, uh, let's see, so, so we'll go ahead and get into groups and 
Um, what we're going to be looking at here is this first study. Um, I, you don't need to read through the methods. I just kind of described the, the critical points about the methods. Um, but there's really uh, here on figure one is where a lot of the, the information is. Um, and the first question that we're going to be asking kind of relates to these two ideas of juvenile versus adult owls. So for a juvenile owl, and you put the prisms on for a month, how does it um, change its sensory map? versus how an adult owl does. And so that's in figure one. Um, so go ahead and get in groups, get out a piece of paper, and the first question to ask is how do young versus old owls respond to this period of sensory manipulation? And we'll spend about six, seven minutes looking at that um, and then come back together. Um, okay, it sounds like people are mostly done with this. Um, so one other thing that I, that I should have pointed out is that there are actually two different kinds of units they use for left-rightness. Um, one is they measure things in microseconds, which is for the interaural timing difference. Um, and then the other thing that they measure is in degrees, which is defined in terms of the visual world. So from here all the way around back to there is 360 degrees. It's a full circle. My vision, I'm able to see, I don't know, something like 160 degrees of, the, of, the, of that circle. Um, and so from this point to this point, is about 1 360th of that whole circle, and so that's one visual degree. If something shifts my vision by 23 degrees, then that means it shifts it from straight ahead to like maybe here-ish. So that's, that's sort of the strength of the prism is that it's this much of a shift. And it happens that because of this distance between the two ears, you can calculate that 23 degrees of visual space will lead to a change of about 70 microseconds in timing difference. So in other words, the, the difference between something straight ahead of me, where things arrive simultaneously, versus here is actually, I, I, it was off by a factor of five or six before. The difference between this and this is 70 microseconds. So here it arrives simultaneously, here it arrives 70 microseconds sooner at this year than that year. And the owl's head is approximately the same size as ours, smaller, but not by a ton. Um, and, so, and so it's about the same. And so in this plot here, the arrow said, there's, a, there's an open arrow at zero, which is the owl should look straight ahead when things arrive simultaneously at both ears, and then a filled arrow over at minus 70 microseconds because after they put on this prism, the owl should um, look straight ahead when the sound arrives 70 microseconds sooner at the, I guess it will be the left ear than the right. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and so, and so what, what sort of happens if we say, so what, and, and what we did here, there are two different owls. And the first owl was 88 days old, which is sort of teenager-ish, juvenile for an owl, um, when you put the prisms on, you leave them on for a month. Um, and then the other owl was more than a year old when we put the prisms on. And we leave it on not just for a month, we give it half a year to play with those prisms, to fly around with those prisms. And, this, and these owls are probably initially bumping into a lot of stuff at first, but, they, but this one at least figures it out. Um, and so, yeah, so how do these two owls differ in terms of the way they, they reorganize their maps? Yeah, sure. Um, the juvenile owl uh, adapts easier to the prisms than the Yeah, so here are juvenile adapts, um, the adult doesn't. Juvenile gets pretty close. If it were perfectly adapted, the peak of, the, of this interaural timing difference curve would be at minus 70 microseconds. It's really closer to minus 56. But it's, made, it's clearly changed the way it responds to sounds and the relative timing in the two ears as a, as a consequence of this sensory alteration that it's undergone. Um, so that's sort of the comparison of juvenile and adult owls. And here, 
on this second figure is a plot showing for a variety of different owls. That was just one example of one owl and one example of another owl. Here, now we're seeing for a variety of different owls um, where they were the moment we put the prism on. So this owl that we saw in the last figure, PR18 is its, is its name. Um, this owl uh, got uh, started out pretty close to zero. After, uh, as the month went on, when we do tests um, one week and two weeks in, the owl has made some alterations. And by a month of experience, the owl has um, pretty much gotten where it should be getting in terms of the, um, in terms of the owl's, um, in terms of the, the organization of its visual system. Um, they also put at the top of this some, some uh, developmental milestones, um, and they're essentially capturing owls between when they're first able to fly, which is at about uh, 30 or 40 days old, um, up until when they, um, when they reach sexual maturity, which happens at about a year and a half. And anywhere in that time window, the owl is able to reorganize its sensory maps, whereas when you take the adults, you let, the, you let them have the prisms for a long time, and they just keep bumping into stuff, and they never reorganize their sensory maps. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? So this sort of leads, what leads you to the idea that there's a critical period, a critical time window. So in this time window, um, between maybe 60 and 120 days old, there's this critical period where if you alter the sensory experience, the animal can reorganize itself. And if you leave the sensory experience alone, then it's going to get set in its ways. If we then... So let's say we take this owl here. And from the, day it was, from the time it was 88 days old until it was 100 and some days old, we had prisms on its eyes. And it reorganized its visual system around those prisms. Then we can take those prisms off. So let's, and let's say, let's actually go a little bit further with this. So, so this owl, for those first, so, so it's got this month with prism experience. Then let's leave those prisms on for like two years. So aside from those first 80 days of its life, for two years of its life, 600, 700 days of its life, it has had these prisms on. It's really, really used to having those prisms on. And then one day we come in and we take them off. Um, and now, now when we go take them off, it's an adult. It's not a, it's not a juvenile anymore. So, so um, what predictions might you make about what happens when we take those prisms off? What are some possibilities that could happen for the owl after we take those prisms off? Sure. Yeah, so one, so one prediction was if they're young when we take the prisms off, they can adapt back. And then maybe the, the corollary to that would be if they're too old when we take the prisms off, they can't adapt back. Is that kind of right? Okay, um, is there anything else that's possible that could happen? What else could potentially happen here? I guess the owl could die from the experience of losing prisms. It could like, get shocked and die, but you know, what is... is if we take it off in an adult owl, is, it, is there any other possibility in the universe that could happen? What else could maybe happen? Sure. Maybe they go back. Great. Yeah. So those are sort of our two possibilities. So we give this owl, we reorganize its map during this sensitive or critical time window. And then for the whole rest of its life, we leave it in this, with these prisms on. And, we, and, and then as an adult, we take those prisms off. And let me find this here. So here we have, for example, this Owl 17. When it was way back here, when Owl 17 was about 50 days or 60 days old, they put some prisms on, and it reorganized within a month. It reorganized its visual map. We don't see that plotted, but it did. And then for the whole next five years between 100 days old and 1,200 days old, um, four years, anyway, um, the animal has these prisms on. And for that whole time, its visual, its auditory map has shifted. Then we take those prisms off. This is a four-year-old owl. It should be too old to reorganize. And yet, within a month, it reorganizes. And it shifts right back. And here are a couple different summaries of this, saying 
Um, so at the age where we move, so if we remove the prisms, if we, if we train an owl so that its, its vision, its, its, its auditory map gets altered, and then we remove the prisms when it's 100 days old, it shifts right back. If we train an owl as a juvenile and then wait until it's 260 days old, it shifts right back. We train the owl as a juvenile and then wait until it's two and a half years old, should be way too old for any reorganization, just shifts right back. Train the owl as a juvenile, leave it for three years, four years with those prisms on, just shifts right back. So, um, and so that seems to indicate that these owls have sort of two different maps. So, so it's not that we, when we train the owl with this new map, it didn't forget the old one, it just kind of silenced it, shut it down, and it still has this other map there, and it can actually really easily access and, and return to that other map. Any questions about that? Oops. Okay, so this is somewhat reminiscent of what happened with these um, with these people that Megan talked about last time, where um, with the original with, with with your natural ears, you can figure out where sounds are coming from up down as long as there's a, a mix of frequencies in them. Um, you put on these clay ears, and you can still tell left right because volume and, um, and timing differ between those. Loudness and timing differ between those. Um, but because the, the filtering properties are different, you lose the ability to figure out up-down. But after a month, people can sort of figure out reasonably well. Um, but then, like, the minute you take those clay ears off, they've already, they're already going, figuring out where things are up-down. They should mess up again immediately upon taking those ears off because they've remapped their brain to, be, um, to, to work with these false ears. But in fact, the moment you take those, pris those, those ears off, they don't, they don't struggle to, to, um, to, 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 to figure it out. They just can like right away switch back to the old way of doing things. Um, one of the things that this reminds me of, so let's see, who, wear, who wears glasses? A couple people wear glasses, maybe, maybe contacts. Um, so one thing that I always experience when I get a new pair of glasses, because my vision sort of changes a little bit over time, is I get a new pair of glasses, and um, gl glasses will either shrink or grow the world, depending on whether you're nearsighted or farsighted. Um, I think, yeah, these are shrink. These shrink. I can never remember. The uh, optics is not my strong suit. But anyway, um, so my glasses sort of shrink the world a little bit. And so if I get new glasses, they're going to have a slightly different strength to them, and they're going to shrink the world a little bit differently. And so what that means is as I move my head around, the world is moving at a different speed. My visual world is moving at a different speed than I expect. Right now with my glasses on, I move my head, and I know how fast the world is going to move with head movements, and I don't get confused and dizzy by it. But when I first get new glasses, I get kind of eye strain and headaches and everything because I've got because I, I can't because I've got this um, the world's moving differently from what I expect. Um, but once I've learned how to deal with glasses, I can do this. And in fact, when I get home, I'm not that nearsighted, and my kids always grab at my glasses, so I just don't want them to. I just don't want them to do that. So when I get home, the first thing I do is I take off my glasses, um, and, and you know the things far away are a little bit blurry. I can't quite tell faces. I might not know who's raising. You know, I might not know who's raising their hand or be able to read words far away. But for most of the stuff that I do at home, that's fine. Um, and when I move my head around here. The world is moving at a different speed than when my glasses are on. But I don't get dizzy with it. My brain has two different maps of how the visual world should behave, um, two different plans or ideas of how the visual world should behave um, with, uh, with changing, moving my head around, that it is able to maintain and instantly switch between. Um, it takes less than a second for me to figure out that my glasses are on and switch. Um, and even like the feel of my glasses probably is part of it. And there are some experiments where if you take somebody who wears glasses, especially strong glasses, and you give them glasses that are just um, that don't minimize or maximize, that just feel like glasses, but they don't actually have any change, then then they will feel disoriented wearing those. But then you take them off and they're fine. And so the feel of having glasses on cues my brain that I need to be in one in one mode or the other. And so the same sort of thing is happening here with our owls. Um, they have, the, you've given them a second map. They don't lose the first map. They just turn it down 
um, and then uh, and then you can quickly recreate the map for them, um, or they can they can sort of adapt back pretty quickly. And so and then and then in fact, if you put the prisms back on, then they can shift back to to having the with prisms map. And so they've got these two different modes of operating that they've stored in their in their brains. Um, and even if you give them an intermediate prism, something that's halfway between the 23 degrees and the zero, um, the 12 degree prism, then they'll be able to adapt to that too. So they've sort of explored this sensory space and created an ability to map, excuse me, those different um, sensory experiences onto, uh, into their visual auditory system. Okay, so what, what questions do people have about any of that? Um, okay, so what we're going to do for the last five, six minutes here is I'm going to hand out a second paper. Um, and this second paper uh, is returning to this idea of, um, of adult barn owls. And now in the second paper, what we're going to do is kind of go back to something like this. This poor owl here who was constantly bumping into things because he was too old to reorganize his visual system when we put um, the, the, um, the prisms on. And so he never or reorganized his visual system. Um, we're going to take some of his friends who um, also spent their entire juvenile life until they were a year old and, um, and give them some prisms. But what we're going to do is instead of giving them a big honking 23 degree prism that changes the visual world dramatically, we're going to give them a little weak prism that changes the visual world just a bit and see if they can remap to that. And then gradually strengthen the prisms that the owls have and see how they remap the world. And so the question to be thinking about and to write down an answer to over the next five minutes is what happens when you do massive shift all at once in an adult compared to gradual, incremental, small changes at a time in an adult. Um, and so go, go ahead and brainstorm on that, write it down, and then turn them in. We will discuss them um, at the beginning of class next time, which is when we're going to wrap up this last, um, this last unit here. And so just, just to orient you a little bit, figure one is like before, where we give them a big old prism all at once. And then figure two is, is where you're giving them smaller prism, when you're giving them prisms in smaller and smaller increments. And one funky thing is the axis here, these are all adults. The x-axis isn't age anymore. The x-axis is just how long they've had the prism on. Um, so zero doesn't mean birth. Zero just means when we started putting the prism on the owl.